Hello and welcome to the third episode of the Witch Hunter podcast, an epic gothic fantasy adventure experience. My name is Domin de Groot, author of Witch Hunter. And yes, de Groot is how you pronounce my last name in Flemish, but I guess you would say de Groot in English. If this is the first time you're listening to the podcast, I suggest going back to episode 1 and start there because it really is one big continuous story. If you don't like listening to it in episodes, well, you can always order the complete adventure online and listen to it in one go. It's available both as a download and in the form of a USB flash drive. More information on that on audioepics.com. That's audio-epics.com. Or audioepics.com, all one word, either one works. Also, if you have comments, questions, or anything you'd like me to read out loud on the show, feel free to comment on the Audio Epics Facebook page, or send me an email at the following address. That's d, as in, you know, the letter d, dot de, you know, as in de, dot groot, you know, as in groot, at audio-epics.com So that's d.d.groot at audio-epics.com I will now leave you with Chapter 3 of Witch Hunter. Nuncius Dei Samina regarded the witch hunter. If you are a man of honor, as you would have me believe, then why do you feel no shame for being part of such a band of hateful, bigoted murderers? Whoever said that I feel no shame? Ludlov was seated on a small wooden stool that he had brought with him as he had entered the cell. Samina couldn't help but be slightly amused by the silliness of the view. Still... She had been determined to remain as tight-lipped as possible. She wouldn't yield to his attempts to lure her into confidence. But rather than stay silent, she had used a different strategy, turning the tables and asking him the questions. To her astonishment, he had answered all of them patiently, and if he indeed spoke the truth, then he was no monster like Vathek. But how could she know? She shrugged. What does it matter? No matter how pleasant you try to appear, you're still a member of that order. Ludlov rose from the stool, towering high above Samina, who was sitting with her back to the cell wall, pulling her folded legs close to her body with both arms in an attempt to stay warm. The witch hunter had noticed it, and he unbuttoned his heavy coat and took it off. Then he kneeled close to her and gently clad her in his coat. She wasn't sure how to react to the gesture, but it made her feel warmer. You yourself are proof that not all magic users are dangerous fools. In the same way, not all witch hunters are hateful, bigoted murderers, Samina. My mentor, Adomir, he was a righteous man. She had been on the verge of granting him a measure of trust, But now the anger came flooding back in. How can you say a thing like that? Witch hunters caused my mother's death. Witch hunters forced us to live our lives in shame and secrecy. And witch hunters put me in this dungeon, taking my freedom and soon, I fear, my life. She bowed her head and let her forehead rest on her knees, which felt sharper and bonier than they used to, even beneath the heavy coat. I promise you, Samina. I will not allow that to happen. He sounded earnest enough. But how could she know? She raised her head and faced him. You say your mentor was a righteous man? Then why didn't he stop the persecution of my kind? Surely he must have had the power to have some influence. The witch hunter remained silent. She had definitely struck a nerve, asked a question he couldn't answer. But then she saw something else in his eyes, passing momentarily like a shadow. Was it 
doubt. Was he actually wondering about her question himself? Adomir was a wise man. It sounded to Samina like he was trying to convince himself more than he was trying to convince her. But he never talked about these things. He was uncertain, distant. He didn't talk to you about the innocent? Only about the dreadful monsters out there? I already knew that there are innocent magicians, Samina. Oh, you already knew. So the topic wasn't important then. Your wise mentor was apparently much more interested in sending you out to do the dirty work of killing the monsters he hated than he was in actually protecting people from danger. For a moment she thought he would raise his voice in anger for the way she had spoken about his departed friend, a man about whom she knew next to nothing. But he remained still, frozen in place, his eyes distant and aloof. She felt the urge to say something, anything to move the conversation away from the dreadful things she had been saying. He trained me to fight. He didn't talk about the innocent. I, I didn't ask for it either. Well, my mother and my brother and I did talk about what the witch hunters did to the innocent, and we... Your brother? No. No, how could she have been so stupid? There was no turning back now. So, you have a brother. Why haven't you mentioned him before? Do you know where he is? She shook her head, it was all she could do. The witch hunter rose again, pacing back and forth through the cell, his hands clasped behind him as if he were taking a stroll through the park, admiring the scenery. Not that there was much scenery to be admired here in this dark cell. I don't know where he is. He left us some time ago. She might as well say this much. She hoped it would satisfy him, but didn't really count on it. Left you. Samina gave the witch hunter a defiant look. Yes. He went looking for... adventure. Ludlove met her eyes, looking unimpressed and beyond that difficult to read. I see. Adventure. This adventure didn't come in the form of the black sickle, by any chance? Goosebumps rose all over her body. She was glad she was hidden beneath his coat or he would have noticed, no doubt. You fool! Do you really think I would tell you anything about where he went? I am not your enemy, Samina. I will set you free and I will return your life to you if you just cooperate. Samina found herself suddenly jerking forward, feeling the cold metal of the chain holding her back. Your kind already took my life in a way that can never be returned, witch hunter. Ludlov shook his head slowly. My dear young lady, if you are thinking of cowardly murderers like Varthek, I assure you they are not my kind. I am not here to bring glory to my name by killing defenseless women. I have but one purpose in this order, to find and destroy evil. More precisely, the evil of the Black Sickle. She swallowed, hoping he didn't see the emotion in her eyes every time when he mentioned that name. I do not know who they are, or what lies behind their organization, but I do know they are pure evil. You can help yourself and the rest of Seven Peaks by helping me. He truly did sound earnest, and she couldn't see any hint of a lie in his eyes. But she was still afraid. What if she exposed Sigurd, and it would lead to his end? Then again, what if this witch hunter was the only one who could actually free Sigurd from the clutches of this cult he had infiltrated? What if the other cult members had seen through him, and held him prisoner somewhere, or, or worse? What if he was already dead? At least Samina could help bring an end to the organization that had killed her brother then. What did she really have to lose by telling this witch hunter about her brother? But he was a witch hunter. He wore the uniform of the oppressors, the destroyers. She took a deep, shaky breath. I will need time. For what? Trusting you. He nodded, apparently satisfied. Good. I will buy you as much time as I can, 
But it isn't much, I'm afraid. The Grand General is counting on my results. Soon. If I don't give her those, I will be put off this case and another witch hunter will take my place. And I think you know what that means. With these words, he left the cell. As the sound of the jailer's keys locking the door echoed through the dark room, she remained sitting there, wide-eyed, thinking of another man like Varthek entering her cell. She shivered, and only then realized she was still in Ludlow's coat. That evening, Ludlow made for the mayor's mansion, for the commemorative feast, and while he was wandering alone through the crowd in the luxurious ballroom, he observed the guests. They were a seemingly varied and colorful group, but still they all shared one trait. They were all rich. At first sight, it seemed like a refined and sophisticated gathering, but the experienced guests would know better. The more one mingled among these people, the more it became apparent that the pretty veneer of civility hardly sufficed to mask the deeply infested decadence of Seven Peaks' finest. The banquet began, and the guests were seated. Ludlow found himself sitting next to Lady Hoskiv herself. Amidst the giggling gossip and repetitive droning of other guests, the Grand General of the Witch Hunter Order was an island of sense and seriousness. Her back straight as the cathedral tower itself, she turned her head and nodded approvingly as Ludlow took place on the chair beside her. During the meal, Ludlow remained mostly silent but attentive. He heard a merchant complaining about the poor health of his servants as an annoyance that affected only his finances. Lady Hoskiv was explaining the witch hunter's relations with Parslevena to a Parslevanian lady who was seated on the opposite side of the table. Ludlow wasn't invested in the conversation, but he followed it passively. The meal was exquisite, but excessive, and contained a wide range of rare and exotic ingredients which, in Ludlow's opinion, weren't necessarily more tasteful than more mundane ones, but the consensus held that they were. He suspected that was simply because these ingredients were expensive. Pheasants from the western wilds, salmon from Wolfen's Lake, spices from Parslevena. The more difficult they were to attain, the better they were deemed to be. After the main course, the Parslevanian lady turned her attention to another guest, now clearly bored by the details of the witch hunter's order's inner workings. Lady Hoskiv was about to say something to Ludlow, but then suddenly she turned her attention to Mayor Grundheim, who was standing upright, alone at the narrow head of the excessively long table. He ticked a small silver spoon to his glass and smiled politely. The chattering around the table died out, and all eyes were now on the host. His voice sounded even more like the squawks of a large bird now that he had to raise it to be heard by all his guests. Dear friends, dear friends, as we are enjoying a lovely feast, for which I cordially congratulate my chef, I would like to draw our attention once more to the tragedy that inspired it. The mayor paused for dramatic effect and let his gaze pass over the crowd. His voice grew more serious. The death of Lord Adamir of the Witch Hunter Order has shaken our community deeply. I believe the person best suited to commemorate him is his close friend and, in Lord Adamir's own words, his greatest student, Master Ludlow. A brief, polite applause followed and Ludlow felt himself stiffening. The speech. He had completely forgotten that he had promised to hold one. Grundheim passed a glance to the Witch Hunter and stepped aside gesturing invitingly to that empty spot beside him with his thin, gangly arm. Master Ludlow, if you would. Ludlow looked at the guests around the table. The looks he saw, on most of their faces, were partly disinterested, partly impatient. That was a relief. At least they already expected him to bore them. Lady Hoskiv shooed Ludlow away with a small head gesture, and then he sighed, rose from his chair, and walked over to the head of the table, his boots sounding awkwardly lonesome on the floor. 
The mayor patted him on the back like a proud father, which only increased the awkwardness of the situation. Bowing his head in thought, Ludlow cleared his throat. <clears> throat> He could see little point in addressing these superficial people who had never really known Adomir, who had no concept of the magnitude of his loss. They would never understand. However, he had been given the task, and so he would bring it to an end. There was no rhetoric in his dry voice when he finally started speaking. I am not prepared for a long speech, so forgive me for my brevity. Another long and lingering silence fell, enough to have some of the guests wondering whether this had already been the actual speech. But then Ludlov knew what to say. Adomir has played a part far greater than that of a mere teacher in my life. He was a friend. And what's more, he was... he was like a father to me. For it was he who took me under his wing when life was at its darkest for me. He taught me hope. He looked some of the guests in the eye. A few of them actually seemed attentive, perhaps hoping to find out some details about Adomir's private life. There was nothing to say about that. Others only wore polite faces but were clearly thinking about dessert. Because of him, I now have a purpose in my life. And I ask you all, can you think of a greater gift to receive than that? A purpose. Few among us have one. I suppose to most of you, life is really just one big feast. Here and there, he noticed a frown from a person who felt that he was veering dangerously close to personal insult. Good, perhaps they would think about it that night. But as I can see before me this very moment, purposeless feasting soon grows dull. One might as well do something useful instead. A nervous laugh emerged from somewhere in the audience, it was probably the best reaction he could hope for. He supposed it was time to commemorate his friend now. For some of you, I know there is a true purpose to this feast, and it is the remembrance of a great man. He looked affectionately at Lady Hoskiv. Others in the audience were still frowning. Adomir was courageous, noble, wise, and bold. He has protected us from evil more often than you will ever know. He has given us more than we can ever give back to him. And so, before we conclude our feast with an undoubtedly lavish dessert, I would ask you all to think of that for a moment and raise your glasses in honor of our fallen friend. Right after he had said this, Ludlov realized he didn't actually have anything to raise. So he reached out and took the nearest full glass of wine, much to the chagrin of the Duchess of Akmilov. To Adomir. Ludlov raised the glass and smiled apologetically at the Duchess. A choir of dull voices repeated his words with all the fervor of old churchgoers, who were still mouthing litanies they only remembered by the letter but had forgotten what they were about. Ludlov then returned the glass to the lady. Thank you. He quickly returned to his seat. There were a few unenthusiastic claps, and then the mayor ordered the musicians to play some relaxing chamber music. Very quickly, conversations about impertinent lackeys and the latest fashion rose up again. Using the chatter around them as a cloak, Lady Hoskiv began a more delicate conversation with the witch hunter in a low voice. Clumsy, unprepared and bordering on downright antisocial, but still not a bad speech, Ludlow. She was sipping from her glass of wine with a calculated look. If he hadn't known any better, Ludlow would probably have thought she had been mocking him. But Lady Hoskiv didn't indulge in sarcasm, and every word she said was exactly what she meant. Rarely more, and never less. You even touched on precisely that which makes you the star of our order. Oh? Uh, Ludlow was genuinely curious. What might that be? She set down her glass, her wrist moving as gracefully as a swan's neck, and locked her appraising gaze on Ludlow's face. Purpose, my friend. Ambition, but not a kind that seeks gain or prestige. True professional ambition. In all my years as Grand General, I have never known a more passionate and unwavering witch hunter than you. Even the dreaded hypnotic magic of the Black Sickle Sculpt members do not seem to influence you. Ludlow agreed, but he felt the need to qualify her statement nonetheless. My passion may indeed be my strength, but 
Do not forget that it is also the salt on an ugly wound, lady. Nevertheless, I am grateful for the gift of moral resilience that Adomi has taught me. I praised him for that. And it is good that you did so. You handled that part well. I am less happy about the obvious contempt you displayed for the majority of the guests here, though. Ludlove smiled and shrugged. They are fools. Maybe so, but believe me, Adomi's death has spawned a new awareness in the nobility and the patricians. It is now clear to them that even the witch hunters are not safe to the dangers of this dark cult of yours. Ludlove felt a surge of warm feeling rising in his gut. Hope. His lady was finally recognizing the true danger of the black sickle. Sadness softened her stern features. Even with all our ancient knowledge, weapons and training, they still have the advantage of their enigma. I'm beginning to fear we lack the means to find them and destroy them. Ludlove frowned. Do not fear the black sickle lady. His voice was so dark it was almost a growl. But the Grand General only looked at him with vague pity. Fear can be an ally, Ludolf. For those who wield it, yes. Never for those in its grip. She contemplated his words. Perhaps. But stay careful, my friend. I think the fire was only the beginning. Ludlove couldn't hide his enthusiasm. Aha! So you agree with me that the Inferno was an act of arson? Of course, Ludlove. I didn't attain the rank of Grand General through naivete. No, whatever this black sickle may be, it is something great and malicious, and its grip on our city is growing tighter and tighter. Something must be done. Something powerful. Courageous. Shocking evil. It seemed as though the elements intentionally strengthened her words when a thunderstrike suddenly resounded from outside. It had been so sudden and so loud that the musicians stopped playing, looking bewildered. The mayor quickly turned his own expression of shock to an overly happy smile and addressed the company. No matter, no matter, it's only thunder. He quickly gestured to the musicians. Continue playing, lads. Continue. <laughs> A nervous little laugh escaped from him, immediately followed by another bolt of thunder. This time even louder than before. People instinctively shrunk back. Most simply sat perplexed. But no one said a word. Slowly, Ludlov rose from his seat, looking out of the window with a concerned frown. Lady Hoskev returned to her stately posture, determined not to allow herself to be intimidated by the unusual event. Nevertheless, they were witch hunters, and witch hunters could tell the difference between the elements of nature and what lay beyond. There was not a shadow of a doubt in Ludlow's mind that this occurrence belonged to the latter order. For a few moments, the entire room was quiet until three massive claps of thunder shook the building, leaving a dark rumbling in its wake, coursing through Ludlov's very body like ripples in the water. People screamed and cutlery fell to the floor. Nobody had an inkling of what was going on, when a sudden wind, as icy cold as the fierce gales of the Horn Mountains, came flying through the door, slamming it open and snuffing all candles and chandeliers. Darkness fell, as black as soot, and then the wind suddenly died, as quickly as it had come. Ludlow found himself standing, looking into the nothingness, listening for clues. Helpless groans and sliding furniture sounded from those who still dared to move. Suddenly, a woman made a terrified scream that made his heart jump. Turning to her voice, he could see a massive flame leaping up. The flickering tongues were not in the orangey hues of normal fire, but were colored bright red, like freshly spilled blood. It was horrific, yet fascinating to behold. And perhaps the worst part of it was that the flames were immensely bright and yet they illuminated nothing. The room remained black. It was impossible, Ludlow thought. It made him wonder whether the darkness itself was real or 
a mass hallucination brought on by some unseen force. If it was, perhaps he could fight it and see through it. He wanted to fight the illusion, if it was one, but found himself too drawn to the bizarre image of the red fire. The flames twisted and whirled, freely moving, like water falling upward, spilling little flames that fled out into the dark and died out. But the fire never lost its frenetic energy. The chaotic pattern broke when a dark shape seemed to arise from within the flames. The continuously streaming red light made it difficult to recognize the shape at first. But then it was clear that there was a tall man standing in the midst of the fire, featureless and as dark as shadow. Some of the guests, both male and female, screamed and wept like helpless children, until a voice boomed forth that sounded like a millstone dragged over a gravel road. Silence! Silence! The command was immediately obeyed. Grundheim, Oskiv, hearken to me. The Grand General's voice sounded tiny and insignificant, but impossibly brave in return. Who are you that you dare use such witchcraft in front of me? I answer to no one. Foolish witch hunter woman, listen to my words. The silence following his words was only broken by the sound of the red flames. A sound that could have been fire or the dripping of blood on canvas. The figure seemed to increase in size and move down the room with slow, confident steps. All who were brave enough to still keep their eyes open could see the man amidst the flames, or rather his sharply drawn silhouette. He spread his arms much like a priest and addressed the company. I shall be known to you as the teacher. I come to you with a warning. Once again, thunder rumbled in the invisible distance. No one dared to move a muscle. The burning of Adomir has been the first sign of the last days. The end of the sacred stones is nigh. And before the coming of the winter, this city shall be swarmed with ravens of darkness. All you know and love shall be destroyed, unless you follow my commands. A single voice dared to answer the messenger. It was Ludloft. Why should we listen to you, sorcerer? The blood-red flames gushed, reaching to the ceiling. Despite the fire's intensity, its light was reflected nowhere. Nothing was visible, except for the man in the fire. Silence! You stand there and call me sorcerer. But I have come to say to you that all sorcerers are the worst sinners. I serve a might far greater than any on this earth. I speak in its name. The man pointed to an indistinct point in the darkness. New red flickers erupted, moving away from one another with increasing speed, drawing lines of glowing red in the blackness. In a few moments, they had formed into a detailed depiction of the round city and its walls. This city is filled with sin and decadence. Within the luminous drawing, shifty eyes welled up behind the windows of the houses. A huge serpent slithered around the walls and started to writhe upwards, slowly choking the city. I speak of those who selfishly draw from the stones and suck them dry. Their madness must end now. The serpent had opened its mouth unnaturally wide, fangs like needles dripping with venom. It stood poised to attack, but then 
It suddenly dissolved into hundreds of tiny little embers. Ludlow felt himself helplessly entranced by the spectacle, unable to do anything. The embers flickered and started to move, slowly, rhythmically, all in the same direction. They were torches, and beyond those torches, faces appeared. Horrible faces, with malicious grins. If you do not heed my warning, the armies of the evil will be here before the coming of the winter. The cathedral in the middle of the city suddenly collapsed into itself, and where it had stood, a bottomless pit appeared, swallowing all. Houses, towers, people, animals, all fell into the depths without mercy. Then there was nothing left. Only the shadowy teacher remained. All sinners must be killed. Think of your city. Then the red fire surrounding him suddenly burst upward and like a liquid splashed on a floor, it fled over the ceiling and disappeared. In an instant, the entire apparition was gone leaving only the darkness. Then that darkness softened as well, until only the natural obscurity of the room was left. Shapes of furniture and people slowly reappeared. Everyone was cowering in fear. No one spoke until Lady Hoskiv put her hand on Ludlov's shoulder. The messenger is gone. Ludlov didn't react. He was still thinking about the teacher and the words he had spoken. All sinners must be killed. What was his agenda? Do not be afraid. It's over. Her glance in Ludlow's direction clearly added, for now, without words. The mayor's head emerged from behind the main table. He quickly stumbled up and cleared his throat, trying to bring some modicum of respectability back to his appearance. He adjusted the fitting of his cloak and moved towards the witch hunters with all the style and grace of a limp dog. Grand General, uh, Master Ludlove, uh, I have guests to comfort and appease. Lady Hoskiv nodded curtly. Of course. That ended the conversation. The Grand General left the room. Just before opening the door towards the welcoming hall, she turned to Ludlove. Follow me, Ludlove. We will continue this discussion in private. So, that was this week's episode of Witch Hunter. We'll be back next Thursday with the adventures of Ludlove and Samina. If you want to find out more about Witch Hunter, you can find us at audio-epics.com and we also have a Facebook page, the Audio Epics Facebook page. Have a great week, everyone!